Welcome to the Climate Council Live and thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're doing a live Q&A on the IPCC report with Professor Will Steffen, who's sitting next to me. He's an internationally renowned climate system scientist and I'm Amanda McKenzie. I'm the incoming CEO for the Climate Council. Uh, last week, as you probably know, we launched the Climate Council, a not-for-profit to provide independent information on climate change to the Australian public. So we're bringing you people-powered science information tonight. And thanks to all of you out there who are making this possible. We have over 30,000 founding friends involved with the formation of the Climate Council. Uh, we've raised nearly a million dollars now. It was a fantastic response, much more than uh, uh, we had hoped for. So we're really grateful for all that support and we'll continue doing what we've done well as the earlier commission and that is to bring you the facts on climate change. That's just what we'll do tonight. And we've had a pretty big week, haven't we? We've put out two uh, reports this week. <laughs> it has been an amazing week. Of, man, things are happening out there. We had the IPCC report come out, and then we just heard a couple of days ago that it's been the warmest September on record. So, in fact, the climate is changing so fast we're having trouble keeping up with it. Exactly. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is that we've had hundreds of questions come in online throughout the day and through yesterday. And what we've tried to do is prioritise the most popular ones, and I'm going to put them to Will tonight. Um, you can continue to ask questions online using the discussion panel below or the hashtag Climate Council. So to kick us off, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the IPCC. Um, Will, can you give an, uh, us an introduction to the IPCC, what it is, how it works and why it's really important? Yes, well the IPCC is probably the biggest scientific assessment of any kind that the scientific community undertakes. It's a partnership between the scientific community and the governments around the world. Hundreds of scientists volunteer their time and effort uh, to go through all the scientific literature, the peer-reviewed literature, assess it, review it, and synthesize it, and put it in a form that's understandable, can be used for policy, can be used by the public. It's a massive effort. It takes on order of five years to produ produce each one of these reports. And the scientists do this because they, they're convinced it's absolutely critical that the most authoritative, reliable, uh, carefully reviewed information is made available out there in the public. Mm. And a lot of those scientists, or well, they all do it on a voluntary basis, don't they? Th that's right. Uh, it's, we feel it's very important that we do this. Uh, we don't expect any, any compensation for it. I've been involved in, in two of the earlier reports, uh, and I can tell you it's a pretty exhaustive process. Uh, the review process is very thorough. There are two very uh, detailed rounds. We have to respond to every comment that's made, uh, d describe why we agree or don't agree with it, and so on. So people who look at these IPCC reports can be assured that it's been given the most thorough, careful, careful treatment by some of the best scientists around the world. Um, the IPCC, as many of those watching would know, put out a very substantive report last Friday. Um, the Climate Council summarised that report. What were the main findings? Well, first of all, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Now, that's a fairly straight, clear English word. Uh, and the evidence for that is, is just overwhelming. We're seeing warming of the air. We're seeing warming of the ocean. We're seeing loss of, of ice and the big polar ice sheets on uh, glaciers around the world. We're seeing loss of Arctic sea ice. We're seeing many changes in the behavior of, of animals and plants around the world, all consistent with a warming world. Point number two, we're actually more certain than we've ever been uh, that it's human activities that are causing the, the most, the, are the primary cause of this warming that we're seeing since about the middle of last century. Again, there are many, many lines of evidence for this. They've become stronger over the past five years with better measurements uh, and better understanding of the processes. Uh, so the IPCC assessed that we're somewhere between 95 and 100 percent certain that it's human activities that are driving these changes. That is really, really an exceptionally strong consensus for a scientific community. Third point. Uh, the IPCC fifth assessment report has confirmed uh, what the special report on extremes uh, said about a year and a half ago, and that is climate change is influencing many extreme weather events, changing their frequency. A lot of them are becoming more, fr more frequent, and they're becoming more severe. So basically, we're changing the risk profile of many aspects of the climate system that, that really affect us the most. And the last is, for the first time, the IPCC has put forward what we call a budget approach uh, to looking at the level of ambition we need to undertake to stabilize the climate system. And we work sort of backwards from a, from a widely agreed policy target, and that is we don't want the climate uh, to uh, rise, the temperature rise to go beyond two degrees above pre-industrial. Uh, it's, uh, it's judged to be very dangerous territory above that. So to stabilize the climate uh, at two degrees or less, we can only burn a certain amount of CO2 between now 
and the time we need to completely decarbonize. And the IPCC puts out numbers for that, carefully reasoned numbers. They're in agreement with earlier budget approaches that we've, for example, used in earlier Climate Commission publications. So I think it's a much, much clearer exposition of the level of ambition we need to, to take to stabilize the climate before it hits really dangerous levels. Mm -hmm. So those are the big ticket items from the IPCC report. The extreme weather point is something that many Australians would be very interested in, particularly with the early start to the bushfire season and it's been the hottest September on record, the hottest 12 months on record. What does this, um, what does what the IPCC has said about extreme weather mean for Australia? Well, I think what it means is, is even at the level of climate change we're experiencing now, which is a little less than, than one degree rise in, in global average temperature, we're already seeing significant influences on extreme weather. If you look at Australia, over the last 50 years, the number of high temperature, the number of record temperature uh, events has increased by more than two. It's more than doubled. Uh, and the number of cold events is going down. So we're really shifting the profile quite strongly toward extreme heat. We saw this in the angry summer. We saw over 100 high temperature records being broken. Hottest day on record, hottest month on record, hottest summer on record. Now we've seen the hottest September on record. Uh, this last 12 months has been the warmest 12 months we've had uh, in Australian uh, history uh, since we've had recorded uh, uh, observations. Now we seem to be tracking toward the, the warmest or hottest uh, calendar year on record. We'll see what, uh, what unfolds the last three months, but um, unless we have some very cool months, uh, 2013 could turn out to be, to be the warmest year yet. Mm. We had quite a lot of questions coming in about sea level rise. Um, Judith, for instance, said that she um, w likes to talk about her concerns about climate change, but sometimes she feels like she doesn't know enough. Um, for example, she asks, why does the melting of ice at the po poles raise sea levels? The argument put forward is that ice takes up more space than water, so when it melts, the physical volume is actually less. Um, what does that actually mean? Can you explain how sea level rise works? Yeah, look, it depends on where the ice sits, actually. Um, when the ice is floating on the ocean, it's already displaced the, the water, so in fact, when it melts, there's very, very little change at the sea level. It's a bit like when you plunk an ice cube in your, in your gin and tonic or in your or a glass of water. Uh, and when you plunk that ice in, the level immediately rises, but as the ice melts, it doesn't change. So if the ice comes from outside the body of water, then it actually affects sea level. In, in the uh, Arctic areas, that would be ice coming from Greenland, for example, which is sitting on land, not on the ocean. So it's the equivalent of putting an ice cube into a glass of water when a big chunk of ice breaks off from the Greenland ice sheet and slides from the land into the water. Of course, another uh, process is simply melting of, of ice that's located on land and flowing into the sea that adds additional water to the ocean. It's those processes which raise uh, the sea. Now, the other point I should make, and to, just to make the sea level uh, uh, issue complete, is that a good fraction of the rise is simply due to the fact that the ocean as a whole is warming. It's absorbing most of the heat from the extra greenhouse gases, and it expands. And as it expands, the level has to rise. Mm. Okay. Um, Aaron noted that on um, Q&A on Monday night with Tony Jones, there was some discussion with David Suzuki about sea level rise, and someone said that there hadn't been any sea level rise at Fort Denison, and that there has been some sea level rise on Pacific Islands, but there's a difference in the level of sea level rise um, around Australia and around the world. Um, is it true that there's not any sea level rise at Fort Denison? Um, was that guy right? And why does the ocean change in peculiar, peculiar ways? Yeah, look, uh, the guy wasn't right. There has been sea level rise at Fort Denison, and there has been around mo most places around Australia. But uh, he is right in saying that there's variation. There's, there is natural variation in how much sea level rise. If you look at the last couple of decades, what we see is along the east coast of Australia, the sea level is rising about the global average, which is about three millimetres per year. But if we look across the top end and, and down the west, it's rising two to three times that much. Mm. Now, we don't know whether that's a long-term pattern. It could be uh, some, some decadal variability. Uh, but nevertheless, it does make the important point that a global average is just that. It's an average. It isn't occurring the same, uh, same way everywhere. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the ocean currents, uh, and they change subtly the sea level rise in different places along the coast. One of the most fascinating ones is actually the Earth's gravitational field. And I'll give you a very counterintuitive example of that. If you look at the Greenland ice sheet that we just talked about, and we know it's losing mass, it's losing um, hundreds of billions of tons of, of ice a year. We can measure that. Uh, you would ex expect then the sea level around Greenland to be rising perhaps a bit more than the global mm -hmm. average because that's where all the stuff's going in, the ice and water. In fact, it's rising less. 
And why is that so? It's because Greenland is losing mass and its gravitational field is actually decreasing. And the sea actually responds to that. So the gravitational pull of other continents is actually relatively more now than Greenland. So it pulls the water away from Greenland. Mm -hmm. So th these are subtle differences that actually can change uh, the rate of sea level rise in regions around, around the Earth. Mm -hmm. And I think people often visualize sea level rise as this um, very slow process. Um, but often what actually matters is the coastal inundation. Can you tell us a little bit about coastal inundation and what we know about that for Australia? Sure, we, we've, we've had coastal flooding before, of course, that does happen. And it invariably occurs when you have a high tide. Well, that's sort of a no-brainer. That's going to put coastal areas at more risk. But also when you have a storm surge coming in, whether you've got a trop tropical cyclone maybe up in Queensland or you've got an east coast low off New South Wales, those big storms just tend to push a wall of water in toward the coast. So you've got this massive water coming in, you've got a high tide, and that leads to flooding. What's happening now is the sea level rise is simply lifting that whole system up. It's come up by about 20 centimeters or so since, uh, uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we're projecting, depending on how much we emit, that could rise by several tens of centimeters up to almost a meter by 2100. Uh, and of course that lifts again this whole system further up. And surprisingly big multiplication factor, you don't have to raise sea level by a whole lot, say by half a meter and you get uh, increased frequency of flooding up to um, 100 or even 1,000 times in some, in mm -hmm. some places. So um, these, these are very serious uh, implications for coastal infrastructure, for coastal communities and property, that even a half a, a meter of sea level rise is going to uh, greatly increase the frequency of, this, of these flooding events. Mm. And I suppose particularly for Australia when we've got all of our cities basically, the big ones are on the coast. That's right, and that's actually true for a lot of places. And, and the most vulnerable uh, places in our region are some of the big delta areas in, in Asia, uh, places like Bangladesh, Burma, um, places in, uh, in Thailand and, and mm. along the Chinese coast. So a lot of our neighbours also share some of our, our problems. Uh, in fact, a lot of infrastructure there is also along the coast. That actually feeds in well to this next question that's come in from Gwen online, which is, what is the 50-year future for low-lying uh, low parts of the world, like Bangladesh and Holland? What, what does the future look like for them? Well, uh, the, the future looks... Um, uh, one of increasing risk, particularly for places like Bangladesh. It's good that you brought up both uh, Netherlands and Bangladesh because it points to the fact that there are hugely different adaptive capacities around the world. Uh, the Netherlands has, has a, a probably arguably the world's best experience at living under sea level. Uh, there are airports five meters under sea level, so they know how to do this. Uh, they know how to, to manage uh, land that is under sea level. Nevertheless, I think the Netherlands themselves are concerned about having to cope uh, with even more rises to sea level. When you switch to Bangladesh, they simply don't have that capability. They don't have the economic resources or the history. So that means that for the same level of sea level rise, you're going to get a much bigger impact in Bangladesh mm -hmm. simply because people and infrastructure are much more vulnerable than they are in the Netherlands. Uh, so again, there is sort of a general theme that's, that's coming out here that when you look at various climatic changes and, and how they're uh, changing risks around the world. It's the poorer countries and the countries around the uh, equatorial region that are most at risk simply because they don't have the wherewithal that wealthy countries like Australia have to cope with at least moderate uh, ranges of, of, mm. of climate change. Uh, you mentioned two degrees when you were describing the IPCC report. We have a question from SB, SJB um, online and says, I thought that the scenarios that talk about two degrees are actually based on a 50% chance of reaching two degrees. Is that true? I would not fly if I had a 50% chance of crashing. Why don't we talk about more realistic probabilities? Yeah, look, I th that's a good question. I think what he's referring to there, or she's referring to, is the fact that in the IPCC report, the budget that they put forward is really based on a 50-50 probability of, of, of uh, staying within that two degrees. So that budget was... Um, a thousand billion tons of carbon since uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we've consumed about half of that now. Uh, but if we consume the other half of it, that only gives us a 50-50 chance. The approach we took in the Climate Commission was to up that uh, likelihood to a 75% probability that we'd stay within uh, two degrees, and that actually squeezes the budget down quite a bit. Um, when you look at the IPCC budget approach and do the same squeezing, you get pretty much the same number. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, um, we have about 600 billion tons of CO2, now I'm, I'm talking about CO2 rather than carbon, that we can uh, still burn and have a 75% chance of staying within that two degree limit. Uh, but when you look at the fossil fuel reserves around the world, uh, they're about five times that great. Mm. So there's an inescapable conclusion no matter how you do the budget, no matter whose budget you use, 
And that inescapable conclusion is most of the world's fossil fuel uh, reserves cannot be burnt if we want to stabilize the climate at yeah. two degrees or less. And to give people some context around two degrees, we're heading towards one degree of warming already. I think right. the IPCC report was... It's 0.85 right. uh, as a global average. Uh, and so we're approaching the halfway point. And already we're seeing, of course, as I mentioned before, influences uh, on extreme events. We're seeing sea level rise. Um, we're starting to see uh, things like uh, methane being lost uh, right now at small amounts from the permafrost, but those are sort of warning bells that if we push the climate too much, uh, we could see some of these big feedback effects come into play. Mm. There's, um, Mark Price has a specific question. Um, he comes from Perth and he says, there appears to be a consensus that as a result of climate change, there will be some places getting wetter and some places getting drier as they receive more or less rainfall. In Australia, Perth is predicted to be at significant risk. Will such dry places like Perth simply become uninhabitable or are there preparatory measures that can be adopted over the coming years to withstand drought? Okay, that's a very good question. And he's right in general, in a broad scale, uh, we've seen that the areas that are already dry around the planet in the historical climate are getting drier and areas that are wet are getting wetter. But in the case of Perth, we actually have a better fix on what's going on. Uh, and that's that the rain-bearing fronts that come off the Southern Ocean in the wintertime, in the cool months, have slipped south by a degree or so in latitude. Uh, and that means more of them are missing the southwest uh, corner of WA. And that's led to a drop in rainfall since about the mid-1970s. Well, what can Perth do about this? Uh, well, it's very unlikely that that rainfall is going to come back. That shift's already occurred at less than one degree temperature rise, and we're talking about uh, stabilizing at two degrees, and it's a big ask even to do that. So don't expect that, that rainfall to come back naturally. So what can Perth do? Well, it's already built, I think, two desal plants mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to turn salt water into, into fresh water. Uh, but, of course, another uh, way to, to manage this is through demand management is to use a lot less water. For example, in southeast Queensland during the big, uh, the big dry on, on the southeast, uh, in the southeast part of Australia, uh, they did an amazing job of managing demand, getting demand down, and making uh, the much scarcer water resources go much further. Uh, so there are many approaches that you can take and, and, and take a mix of new technology and demand management. The message is... Um, in many of the populous parts of Australia, we do have, I think, an increasing risk for water resources, uh, and we need to, to be prepared for long, dry periods, which uh, are definitely possible in the future. Mm. We now have a few questions about methane, which is a stronger dr greenhouse gas than um, carbon dioxide. Um, Simon asks, I understand the climate models do not include methane emissions. Um, methane is more powerful than CO2. Should it be included in the IPCC? Well, it's certainly included in the IPCC assessments. When you look at the IPCC's judgment, judgment of all the ways that humans are affecting climate, methane is one of the important gases. It is indeed included in, in the climate models. It's included in the forcing factors that drive those models. Uh, and yes, it is much more potent per molecule than carbon dioxide. But I should add that it has a much, much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere. Uh, about half the methane that you emit is gone in only a decade whereas significant amounts of CO2 are up in the atmosphere for hundreds and even thousands of years. And by the way, uh, when methane disappears, it doesn't actually disappear from the atmosphere. It's actually oxidized, and it, it turns into CO2. So it still stays up there in another form. And um, <coughs> methane is also important because of the melting of the permafrost and um, methane leaking out of the permafrost. Shelley has a question about that and asks that she's heard about it and what will it mean for climate change? Well, basically what, 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 what she's talking about there is there's an enormous amount of carbon uh, stored in those northern wetlands up in Siberia and northern Canada. And most of that's now in soil. It's actually frozen, so it's locked away. To give you an idea, the amount of carbon that's stored there is about equivalent to the total amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere now. So there's a lot of carbon up there, and it can make a huge difference if it comes out. We're starting to see some melting of the permafrost. Uh, we've measured that, and you're starting to see some methane emission. At present, it's still fairly small and is not making a significant contribution as yet. The concern is if we uh, see much more melting of the permafrost, say if the, the average temperature hits 2 degrees, and bear in mind there's about a double. There's an amplification up in the northern latitudes. It's about double. So you're talking about 4 or 5 degrees forcing on the permafrost. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens and that is, as that permafrost melts, the bacteria which actually decompose all that rotting organic material, they take off. They've now, uh, they're no longer frozen. The soil temperature is coming up. But the reaction that creates the methane from the organic matter actually is a reaction which creates heat. 
So you have a feedback mechanism within the soil that as that, uh, as that bacteria become, as those bacteria become active, they heat the soil more, which melts more from a permafrost, which activate more bacteria and so on. So the concern is you have a feedback within the soil as well as a feedback in the atmosphere, which warms those areas. So these are the sort of things we want to avoid. Most scientists think that if we can limit uh, the temperature rise to no more than two degrees, we'll probably uh, not activate a lot of that methane. But beyond two degrees, uh, there's a lot of concern that we could see um, uh, uh, tens uh, to hundreds of billions of tons of additional carbon coming out of the permafrost. Uh, there's more carbon, too, stored in the ocean sediments uh, along uh, the coastlines and up in the Arctic Ocean. There's concern there, too, that if we um, uh, warm up the o Arctic Ocean uh, too much, we'll see methane bubbling out of the ocean sediments as well. So there's some, there's some scary things up there. It actually matters for Australia what happens in the far north because it affects our climate, mm. too. There's some other questions coming in um, live about population. Uh, John asks, I understand the general facts. But is it not a fact that the world population will reach 7 billion in my lifetime, and that's the real issue? Well, I have news. It actually has reached 7 billion uh, already. So mm -hmm. the question is, uh, where are we going to stabilize? Uh, I think it's, it's everyone's hope that we can stabilize population between 8 and 9 billion. Obviously, it is a factor in, in greenhouse gas emissions. But in fact, if you look at it historically, uh, the emissions until recently, until the last 10 years, have been dominated about t by about 20% of the world's population. And that's the so-called OECD countries, the wealthy countries. And they have dominated uh, emissions until about 10 years ago. So there's a, a big imbalance in terms of the number of people, but the consumption uh, of a small group of people. Uh, that's changed now as China and India come online. So it gets, a, it gets to be a very complicated question, this question of population. Uh, I would say that obviously it'll make life easier if we can, if we can stabilize the world's population for a whole range of environmental issues, including climate change. Hmm. Um, there's been a few questions coming in through the day on ocean acidity. Um, many people have asked questions about it and Paul probably sums it up best. He says, why are the oceans acidifying and what are the implications for humanity? Okay, the oceans are acidifying because they're actually absorbing some of the CO2 that we emit from fossil fuel combustion and, and deforestation. Right now they're, uh, they're absorbing about a, a quarter to a third every year. Uh, of the emissions that we put in the atmosphere. And that's a good thing because it's taking a good fraction of the carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and would slow the, uh, the rate of climate change. But it's a bad thing because by absorbing uh, CO2, uh, the ocean waters form uh, an acid, carbonic acid, uh, and that increases the acidity of the ocean. So uh, organisms in the ocean that rely on calcium carbonate for their shells, coral reefs are a classic one, but there are other ones. Uh, are now at risk not only from warming ocean, but from an ocean that's becoming more acidic. Uh, and if this uh, continues at the high end of the uh, emission scenarios, uh, toward the end of this century, uh, coral reefs will definitely be in trouble. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll have trouble just keeping up their calcification rate, because as fast as they can make calcium carbonate, it's going to start dissolving. So um, this is a very, very serious issue for, for many marine ecosystems. What does it mean for the Australian Great Barrier Reef? Well, the Great Barrier Reef really, uh, in a way, has a, has a double or triple whammy uh, from, from climate change. It's got the ocean acidity issue, um, which may already be playing a role. We've seen, if you look at the Great Barrier Reef, that the calcification rates have dropped by about 15% over the past 30 or 40 years. Now, there are probably multiple factors affecting that, but one of them is probably the fact that the ocean's becoming a bit more acidic. The one that people are probably more familiar with is coral bleaching. Many people have heard of that. And that is caused by, if you like, an underwater heat wave, a heat wave that goes through the surface waters of the ocean. Uh, the corals become too hot, uh, and they bleach. They spit out the little uh, symbiotic uh, bacteria that help them um, with their photosynthesis and nutrient cycling. They turn white. They can recover from that uh, if the ocean temperatures go back down. But if they're bleached too often uh, and too many times in a row, then they die. Uh, and that's what's happening to some coral reefs around the world. Uh, it's happened to some of the uh, Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, but in fact, if you look at the multiple factors that are affecting the reef, uh, I think we've seen about uh, a drop in about 50% of coral cover mm. in the last 30 or 40 years. Now, there are local factors, too, uh, runoff of effluent from, from Queensland agriculture, uh, some fishing pressure and so on, uh, and shipping through the Great Barrier Reef as well puts some pressure on some of those reef ecosystems. So, in fact, it's, it's multiple things mm. that affect the reefs. Um, and I think as we go through this century, if we don't, if we don't get our emissions down, 
uh, acidity and, and underwater heat waves are going to become more prominent as, as forcing factors for these changes. Mm. Um, Julie's asked a question live and um, she asks, I'm watching this with my computer on a battery pack because we're getting our first early lightning storm of the wet season after a terribly dry winter. We're in a very high risk fire area. How is warming going to affect Australia's fire risk in Queensland as well as New South Wales and Victoria? Well, climate change affects uh, fire risk in a number of ways. Some of them are pretty complicated because they affect the vegetation, how much there is uh, and what condition it's in. But there's one aspect we're pretty clear about and that's what we call fire danger weather. That's the weather that occurs when fires uh, break out or is, uh, makes it prone for fires to break out. These are extremely hot days. Uh, these are days with low humidity and days with high winds. And those are the types of conditions that are more directly related to how the climate is shifting because we know the climate is getting warmer. So around Australia, we have 38 stations, weather stations that actually routinely measure this fire danger index. And we can go back three or four decades, which is just long enough to start to see a trend. And what we see that in none of those 38 stations is the fire danger weather going down. But in 16 out of the 38, it's going up. It's risen significantly. Now, interestingly, and, 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 and this is apropos of this question from mm -hmm. Queensland, Queensland actually isn't included in that area that's showing an increase in fire danger weather. It's actually in the southeast. It's in New South Wales, Victoria, um, South Australia, and Tasmania. But the question from Queensland is an interesting one because it's bringing in other factors, uh, and that is the very long, dry winter. The reason that you don't see an increase in fire danger weather in Queensland is normally it's too wet, and, that, and, and normally the rainfall is, is pretty much kept up uh, through, um, through the last several decades. But when you get the dry winter, that's when you're going to get uh, uh, increased fire danger weather. Mm. So we've got a, question, a couple of questions now that are focused more on international action and what uh, countries are doing about it. Laura asks, in light of the outcomes of the Doha um, COP of 2012 and now the IPCC's uh, fifth assessment report that came out last week, what are the prospects for a truly global agreement on greenhouse gas emissions that set the target um, reductions to avert, avert accelerated climate change? Does the international negotiations matter and how much? Well, look, I think this is still quite a ways to go to get a, 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 a binding international agreement. Uh, that's the bad news. But there's a lot of good news, and that is there's a lot of action outside the international negotiations that's already occurring. It's actually actions occurring on a bilateral basis, countries getting together. It's action occurring within countries like the state of California and the USA, which has put in an emission trading scheme. It's a lot of action occurring on the national level. Uh, so a lot of um, people who study international relations would call this a confidence-building stage, that countries are, are working out how they can get emissions down. Uh, and many of them are finding that they can indeed do that and probably do it at lower cost than they thought. So this is building confidence that when they go back into the COP negotiations, they have more confidence that they can put forward uh, more ambitious uh, targets uh, and be confident that they can meet them. Uh, so I think this is actually paving the way uh, for a, a better and, and more secure treaty down the track, and one that countries will have a lot more confidence that not only they will meet them, but they will have confidence that other countries can meet their uh, targets as well. And uh, the other climate uh, commissioner, Roger Beale, often talks about this. If you yeah. can build up grassroots action all around the world, you'll get a better chance for a treaty. You can't really start from the top down only. That's right. I think the top down approach has shown that it's pretty, pretty difficult and not very successful. But the other good news, of course, is the big giants out there, USA and China, are really starting to move now on, on climate change. And that puts the heat on the next tier down, about 15 countries or so, that are the second level. We're one of those. Mm -hmm. Our emissions are about the same as Italy, the same as France, a little bit less than, than the United Kingdom. And of course, when you look at it per capita, we uh, emit more than any of the other OECD countries per capita. So a lot of countries do look to Australia to, take, uh, to play its role. Uh, and now that the big, the big ones are moving, uh, China and the USA, uh, I think uh, it's even more pressure on the rest of us to come along and play our bit. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about Australia's targets, live from Nick. He asks, with the release of this IPCC report, what 2020 emissions reduction target does the latest science demand for Australia? Well, I, I, look, I, I look at these short-term targets as just um, points along a, a, a much longer and deeper uh, emission reduction curve. And, and I think the way to look at it is to actually use this budget approach, because the budget approach get, gets away from exactly when do you have to have emissions down by. Uh, but what 
what the budget approach says is once you start chewing up that budget, you don't have much left. Anyone with any sense would know that the earlier you can get emissions down, uh, the more ordered and, and, and the more gentle will be the, the curve that takes you down toward decarbonization. So rather than and just burn our budget and then say, oh my God, we've got to get emissions down in the next five years, you know, that's a, ter a terribly abrupt uh, change to an economy and an energy system. You start working now. You start moving as vigorously as you can to make the transition as smooth as you can. And that's why there's a lot of pressure on now uh, to get moving now rather than two or three years down the track. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there's been a lot of questions coming in regarding ocean storage. Um, people want to know why the ocean absorbs so much of the warming and what does that mean for climate change in the future? Okay, it, it, it absorbs so much because it's huge. It's, it's uh, two-thirds of the Earth's surface. Uh, it, there's an enormous amount of water there and water has a much, much higher heat capacity than air. Per unit uh, mass water, you can just absorb a lot more. Uh, a lot more heat. So uh, that's why it's mainly going in there. It's a, just a matter of basic physics. It's a lot more water and it has a higher heat capacity. What does it mean? Uh, it means that the atmosphere is actually going to be whipsawed by what happens in the ocean. So very subtle changes in the ocean are going to give you spurts of, of strong warming and then periods of little or no warming in the atmosphere. That's just the way it works. The atmosphere is sort of at the mercy of what the ocean does. And we see that already in, in, in El Nino and La Nina years. In La Nina years, uh, the atmosphere tends to cool. In El Nino years, it tends to warm. And climate change is adding another wrinkle to that by, by changing the, the distribution and the amount of heat in the ocean. Now, the water in the ocean circulates. And so what I like to say is what goes down comes back up. Mm. Uh, so even though the, some heat's being stored in the ocean, a lot of heat's being stored in the ocean, and that uh, varies a little bit too, uh, that can give us a bit of a reprieve when more of it goes into the ocean and less uh, goes into the atmosphere. Uh, but what it means is that's going to come back up later down the track when that warm air uh, resurfaces. And you actually see that in the past record. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, uh, a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's a, uh, perhaps a little bit of warning to say, listen, uh, uh, yeah, it's nice that it's going into the ocean. Uh, maybe for us humans, maybe not so much for the marine ecosystems. Uh, but it's going to come back to bite us when, when that uh, re-equilibrates re with the atmosphere. It's interesting because scientists have obviously known for a very long time that the oceans are absorbing a lot of the yeah, heat. We have. But most of the public discussion is focused on air temperature. So the oceans uh, receive about 90% of the heat, that, um, the extra heat, and the air temperature is about 3%. And I think that's one of the elements of the confusion that surrounds the next question which is from Eugene, he says, is it misleading for new scientists and other publications to state that the warming has slowed since 1998 without explicitly stating they're referring to atmospheric warming? And you, can you talk a little bit about this so-called pause? Yeah, look, that's absolutely right. Uh, you hear many comments like the earth has stopped warming or cli the climate has stopped warming, when in fact what they're talking about is the, the global average air temperature. And there are a couple of myths here. One, in fact, it actually hasn't stopped warming. Even when you look at that 98 to 2012 period, there is a warming trend, albeit at a lower rate than, than the previous decades. But there's an interest, interesting way of looking at this. We know exactly why this is happening. Uh, and it has to do with a combination of the fact that the sun is in a period now where its intensity is a little bit less than it was a few decades ago. And this happens uh, from time to time. You have more intensity and less intensity. Uh, and at the same time, we've had a series of very strong La Nina events. And as I just mentioned, they tend to cool the planet. So when, you, when a scientist looks at that and says, look, at uh, solar intensity is down, a string of strong La Nina events, the temperature should be dropping like a rock. In fact, it's still going up. And so that's telling you there's a strong underlying trend pushing that temperature up despite, despite the natural factors that should be decreasing the temperature. We can actually quantify this. And when you actually adjust the observed temperature from these known, well-known and well-understood factors of solar intensity in La Nina, and the odd volcano, which tends to cool the climate, when you adjust, the underlying warming trend just goes straight up. Mm. Uh, so there's absolutely no problem with, with the climate system. We understand what it's doing. We understand why it's doing. It's the interpretation out in the media and the public that's actually wrong. There's some irony there, isn't it, that the media says that oh, it's stopped warming when actually what you're saying is the trend is actually scarier. Like when you take away some of these natural factors that are slowing the rate of warming. Yeah, it's exactly. still going up. That's right. But very quickly. 
Um, there's another question about this that um, relates to the media, which says, despite all the efforts of the Climate Council and many other scientific and advocacy groups, there's still considerable scepticism in the Australian community. Um, what is the psychology of climate scepticism and how many people hold such beliefs? Well, you'd have to ask, ask a psychologist about what, what the uh, psychology of sceptics is. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but what I will, will say is I think there have been some surveys by CSIRO. Mm -hmm. Uh, there have been some surveys by, uh, by a scientist named Joe Reeser up at uh, Griffith University who actually look at how, um, how these uh, uh, proportions of people, what they believe or think about climate change, how they change through time. And it's interesting that there is a fairly common pattern coming out in Australia, and that is uh, the number of skeptics out there who tend to be really noisy are actually very small. So if you look at the number of really dyed-in-the-wool true skeptics, they're under 10%. Uh, the vast majority of people certainly understand that the climate is changing, and a significant fraction of those people understand that it's human activity that's, that's changing the climate. Uh, so I think there's a broader base of support for action on climate change than most people think. There's obviously a debate about what, whose policy is best uh, about it, but I think th this idea that there's somehow a 50-50 debate amongst, amongst scientists, absolute crap, there hasn't been a debate for decades. And the fact that there's a huge number of skeptical people in Australia, that doesn't seem to be the case. I think it's under 10%. Mm. And that's definitely brought out in the recent CSIRO research, which was done on community attitudes. I think it was 7 or 8% of people were genuine skeptics that thought it wasn't happening or mm. humans played no role at all. Um, there's some questions coming in that are about um, Pacific Islands. Um, Warwick asks, what's the outlook for our neighbours in the Pacific? Well, it, it depends on, on which islands you, you look at. They, of course, they vary. Uh, in the long term, the lowest lying islands, uh, not very good prospect. Um, in many areas, they're already seeing uh, some, uh, some impacts from a rising sea level in their water supplies and their water table and, and so on, and in coastal inundation. Um, obviously, a lot of them are fairly vulnerable anyway to storm surge. And as I mentioned before, that rising sea just raises that whole system of storm, storm surge, flooding, inundation of, of coastal waters and so on. It just makes that more probable mm. and it occurs more often as you raise, raise the base. Uh, so in the long term, uh, again, it depends very much on how much we emit uh, in terms of CO2. Many of the small island states, the Pacific island states and, and their colleagues from the Indian Ocean and, and, um, and so on, have argued very strongly that 1.5 degree ought to be the, the limit, not 2 degrees. They think 2 degrees is already too much for them, and, and in many cases they could be right. If you look at Australian territory, it's actually the Torres Strait Islands that are the most vulnerable of any Australian territory to, towards sea level rise. Uh, and a couple of them are already exceptionally low-lying. They're already subject to inundation from high tides and storm surges. So if you like, sea level rise up there is the straw that broke the camel's back. And it seems likely that some of them will have to be, some uh, people will have to be moved out within the next couple of decades mm. uh, because it's simply their islands won't be viable anymore. Uh, we'll see that happening in, in some of the Pacific Islands too, um, I think, over the coming three, four decades. Mm. Um, we've got some other questions that have come in about uh, communication. Um, Margaret Burke asks, um, she says that the Australian government and the media are the biggest obstacles in addressing global warming. Do you believe it's time for the media and governments to be held accountable for their actions? Well, certainly from the point of view of a scientist, we always like to see science presented in, in as fair and accurate a way as, as possible in the media. And there, there are obviously some very good examples of good me, uh, media coverage in Australia, but there's some, uh, many examples of the opposite too. Uh, so I think it is time uh, for the media to get on uh, and just move away from this absolutely phony debate about the science uh, that they've liked to pursue for, for quite a while here in Australia. The IPCC report's clear. It is unequivocal that the climate is warming. And we know, even with more certainty, that it's human activities that are causing this. Let's, get, let's just get beyond this and now talk about the risks, the nature of the risks, and talk about uh, what Australia needs to do to get on top of this problem. Those are the real issues that need to be out there and, and discussed in the media. Mm. There's a, another question that's now about wind energy, but it's also related to communications. Um, wind energy is Australia's cheapest renewable energy source and will play a key role in meeting the 2020 renewable energy target. Um, public discourse around the technology has been plagued by misinformation and disdain for experts. Um, can advocates of wind energy learn anything from science communicators working in the field of climate change? 
Do you have things that yeah, you can share? That's, <laughs> that's, that, that's a really good question. I, I, I think what you need to do is, is, is just carefully engage people who have these, these views on wind energy, just like we try to do on, on uh, climate change. Um, some of them you may be able to uh, discuss and, and uh, convince them that there isn't a big problem out there. Uh, you can uh, give examples of countries like Denmark, which is where a lot of wind energy was developed, and they have a, a very uh, significant fraction now of their energy supplies by wind. Uh, they've gone through all this process. They have a, a one-kilometer buffer for their wind energy systems around uh, any, anyone's dwelling, and that seems to work fine, and there's uh, no problem with the Danes. So a lot of this, th- this, this angst about wind energy has actually been solved by people who have gone through that process earlier, so we can learn from that. In terms mm-hmm. of communication... Uh, look, it's, it's, it's tough convincing someone who has a worldview or, or a political belief uh, that, that uses that worldview or political b- belief to filter scientific information and take only that information that agrees with their belief system and ignore, ignore the others. And, and that's something that I think no matter how well we communicate, it's tough to get through that sort of barrier. Mm. There's a bunch of questions that are coming in about solutions as well and a number of people have been asking about direct action and tree planting. Frank has said uh, tree planting and um, carbon sequestration. Are these techniques any, any use and will they be enough to reduce our emissions? Right. Well, that, that's, that's uh, uh, a question that engenders a lot of confusion. Sometimes we like to call it carbon confusion. Uh, in fact, when you look at the science, you need to differentiate between carbon that comes originally from land sources and carbon that comes from fossil fuels. So carbon that comes from deforestation, for example, is already in the active fast carbon cycle, as we call it. It's cycled between the land, the atmosphere, the uh, upper ocean very fast. Now, a fraction of the carbon in the atmosphere actually is derived from deforestation around the world, some from deforestation in Australia. It's actually good for a number of reasons to get that carbon back down in landscapes. It can give you biodiversity outcomes, it can improve productivity, it can improve soil carbon, and so on. What it can't do is offset for fossil fuels. Mm. What fossil fuels do is they take carbon that's underground, it's locked away, and it isn't part of that active cycle. It's new carbon, different carbon, additional carbon. And you burn it and you activate it and you put it in the atmosphere. And it's a, an additional load on that active cycle. Mm. So um, when you look at it from that point of view, you can't offset fossil fuel emissions by taking carbon and shoving it into landscapes. It's not to say it's a good thing because there's a big carbon debt from deforestation and from agricultural practices that would be good to repay. But if we use that as an offset and say, well, we can burn more carbon, it's counterproductive. You're just making yourself a bigger problem for the future. Mm. Um, A number of people have also written in asking about um, what they can do and how they can be involved. Andrea, I thought, epitomised this. She said that um, she would like to know what she can do personally as an individual to help reduce climate change. I hear and read so many reports of big companies needing to reduce their carbon emissions, but not so much about what individuals can do, and I feel like the message is often mixed. I'd like to take a more active part, and I think maybe forming a small community group, like a climate council community for change, could be something the climate council could be involved with. What do you think of Andrew's suggestion? (laughs) Well, that's a very interesting one, but I I may actually throw that back to you, Amanda, because you've had a lot more experience in in action on climate change than than I have as a scientist. So, I mean, you've been been involved in in getting large groups of people together uh, through uh, social media and so on. Uh, What can individuals really do? Yeah, well, I think there's, um, there's lots of opportunities no matter where you are. And I think one of the things that the Climate Commission has done over the last couple of years is we encourage people to to speak to those around them, whether it's in the schoolyard or whether it's um, at the workplace or family and friends. Because I think um, although some people say, oh, it's just talking, well, actually, action happens when there's a a critical mass of people who want action to happen. And it's important that we continue to talk about it, we continue to um, get out there and tell people what the facts are. So I think that that's something that the Climate Council can help with as we continue to put facts on the table. There's also a bunch of community groups that people can have access to or um, get involved with if they're interested. And um, obviously I I was involved in setting up the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, which has done um, a lot to engage young people around this issue. Um, But yes, I think that there's a lot people can do, not just in their personal life in terms of reducing their own emissions, but also getting involved in changing attitudes. Um, There's another question, um, a couple more questions coming in around... um, around what we can do as a society. Uh, 
people, Iris asks, with 30,000 members, is it possible to take a pledge to do one additional thing in practical terms to reduce yep. our carbon footprint? Is promoting that kind of thing within the scope of the new Climate Council? Um, well, I'm not sure whether it's, it's in our scope to get down to that level. Um, as a scientist, I would say that, uh, as I've said many times, even tonight, it really is important we get on with the job of reducing emissions um, as fast as we can and as deeply as we can. And that involves the big players, of course, but it also involves a lot of individuals. So just as Amanda said, I think things like that can grow. So um, uh, people, you know, people can do their own thing. I mean, I've tried to do my own thing. We've, my wife and I have de uh, downsized to a small apartment and cut our electricity use uh, in half. We've moved close to where, where we work, so we both walk to work and leave the car in, in the garage. Uh, so there are a number of things you can do. And by the way, we think our lifestyle is actually better. So uh, there are a lot of things you can do, I think, and, and according to your own circumstances uh, in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, the thing that we're discovering is, in fact, it's no impost at all. In fact, as I said, I think we think we're improving our lifestyle uh, by living a little bit simpler life and, and cutting down on the resource use. Uh, you often talk about that, Will. I think that there's, there is a perception that if we, if we change, it's inherently... Um, we're going backwards in terms yeah. of our lifestyle. But that yeah. hasn't been your experience. Absolutely not. No, I'm, I've got a very simple uh, uh, philosophy on this. You know, I don't think we're living in the best of all possible worlds now. And I think if we thought that, we'd start being humans. Humans have always innovated. We've always been creative. We've always changed. If we hadn't, we'd still be in, in caves, you know, using stone tools. But we didn't. Before the, st the stone tools ran out, we moved to bronze. And then we moved to agriculture and so on. We always innovate, we're creative, we're trying to do things better, we're trying to improve our well-being. This is another big step, another big transformation in terms of human development on planet Earth. Uh, and I think if you take the view that this is an exciting challenge, it's something that's going to make a better world for your children and grandchildren, then it's an exciting pathway we're on rather than an impost. Mm. I, th I think many people would appreciate that sentiment. And we've got a, quite a few questions coming in about um, innovative technology. Um, and particularly about splitting hydrogen and wa water. Um, one person asked, I'd love to know the council's thoughts on the University of Colorado's, Boulder's recent um, study developing renewable energy by splitting hydrogen atoms from water mo molecules. I understand that's a completely carbon-free transaction. Can that method be adopted and what would be the preferred development for industry and governments? Uh, okay, no, I'm not completely familiar with that particular technology, but it does take energy to split uh, hydrogen off water, quite a bit of energy. So it would depend on where that energy comes from. If you use a coal-fired power station, then you are uh, generating carbon. If you use solar, then you're not. Uh, this, I think, is the basis of the so-called hydrogen economy, that once you split off hydrogen, hydrogen gas, then you can recombine it with oxygen, uh, and that generates a lot of energy, and the byproduct, water water vapor. Mm. So it, that, that particular process is carbon free. Uh, there are many other uh, possible technologies out there. There's using electricity itself to power transport. Electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles is a transition to electric vehicles. Uh, a lot of public transport already is electrified. A lot of rail is electrified. Uh, buses can be electrified uh, and so on. So uh, th there's questions about whether you go to a hydrogen economy or whether you go straight to electric, uh, electric run vehicles. But there, the point is, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, as our colleague Jerry Houston likes to say, it's silver buckshot. It's not a silver bullet. There's not one magic solution. So uh, as I said, it's great to see this type of innovation. This could indeed be, be part of the mix. Uh, and let's just let, uh, let the creativity, um, uh, let that go out there and try to solve these problems. There's um, a range of people that have been writing in asking about renewable technology and obviously the Commission's put out a number of reports on renewable technology. Can renewable energy provide baseload power, asked ask Janet, and she asked what would that mean for Australia if we were to move towards more renewable energy? Yeah, look, I, th I think there's a bit of a misconception here about baseload because that's what we've had. Really what we want is, is reliable energy uh, generated uh, at the right times and delivered to the people when they need them. Now, now, the reason I say that in a rather complicated way is it's leading on to this idea of smart grids uh, in terms of having a, a very high-tech grid with a lot of information technology built in that can move electricity around, store it uh, when we're not needing it, uh, and then use it and move it around to where it is needed. What that does, it tends to even out a lot of the reliability issues with renewables. Uh, if you just look at two, the two major ones, solar and wind, they actually tend to complement each other. Because uh, quite often when the sun isn't shining and it's a bit cloudy and, and stormy, you've got a bit more wind. 
Uh, there's some really in interesting ways you can store solar. You can store it in car batteries, for example. When you're not driving your car, you can uh, load it up there. And then when you need to run your car, you can run it. You can store it in, in, in uh, pondages like hydroelectricity. You don't have to dam a running river. You can just make a pondage. When you have excess sun on a sunny day, you can just pump the water up. At nighttime or on a cloudy day, you can let the water down and, and drive a turbine. So there are many, many clever ways that, that we can solve these problems. I think that we're really getting on top of the, the solar PV technology itself, looking at the individual cells. The next big challenge is storage and smart grids, and there are a lot of good people working on those. I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, why was this such a big problem? Mm. And obviously, um, we put out a report um, a few months ago on solar and looking at um, Australians taking up solar energy. There's something more than a million people now have taken up solar energy in Australia. This has been a huge mm. growth curve. Um, Kim um, may sum up what some people are feeling um, watching this. They've said, um, Professor Will Stephan is great, but I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't have a science background. Please tell me what to say to my family and friends in 30 seconds. All right, I think what the IPCC said. The climate's warming, overwhelming evidence. We know why. It's our activities, mainly fossil fuel combustions. The risks of this are rising for our children and grandchildren, but we actually now have many of the solutions out there. We need to get on with the job. That's my 30 second <laughs> That was a very good summary. Um, we've just, we need to wrap up in a few minutes, but there's been a range of questions coming in today, but also through the week about um, the Climate Council, what it will do and um, what impact it can have in the Australian community. Um, Catherine asks, there is a number of climate change organisations in the Australian public space um, dedicated to action on climate change. Why is the Climate Council unique and what unique benefit, benefits can it offer for the Australian public? Yeah, very, very good question. There are a lot of organisations out there and they're doing a lot of great things. Many of them are in the advocacy space and in the democracy. We need those organisations and we need them to be effective. But we think there's a particularly strong role for the Council because our job is simply to get, that, get out there and put out the facts put out the facts about the science, put out the facts about what other countries are doing to get their emissions down, put out the facts about various instruments we can use to get our emissions down. So we're apolitical, we're unbiased, we don't even comment on policies, we're not going to comment on the government's policy, we're not going to comment on the opposition's policy. Our job is simply to put the facts out there on the table uh, so that people have an authoritative, unbiased source they can rely on. Hmm. And um, what what activities do you think the Climate Council will do in the next um, three to 12 months? Well, we've got a lot of uh, reports on, on the card, and as fast as the climate is changing, I'm sort of shuddering in horror at the number of reports <laughs> we've got to get out. You know, it's going to be the, the warmest calendar year on record. We'll probably have some bad bushfires. These aren't good things, but unfortunately they are happening. So reports is something we do, and I do a lot of media around reports. We like to engage the public as much as we can. Um, we ha had a number of public forums as a climate commission. We'd like to c continue engagement in various ways, uh, maybe continue to have s forums. Uh, the councillors, like myself and my colleagues, go out as individuals representing the council and talk to uh, groups as they have conferences and workshops and so on. Uh, we try to do that as much as we can. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, and we do a lot of um, social media and so on. Yeah, and um, I might just add there that we've, um, in the last week, we're really just setting up the new organisation. So we hope to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can, but there is, um, there is a lot of work in setting up the organisation as well, so um, needing to manage everyone's expectations in how much we can get done as quickly as we can. But yeah. we will, we've already put out some two short reports and we really encourage everyone to have a look at that and um, share it with your friends and family. Um, so that's basically all we can do for tonight, but we've still got lots of questions coming in and we'll do our best to, um, to answer them where we can. Um, if you've liked tonight, this is a bit of an experiment for us, um, doing a, a, a live YouTube, YouTube stream like this. And if you've liked it, we'd love your feedback and we'd like to know if you'd like us to do it again. And if so, on what sorts of topics. Um, so thank you all so much for your comments and questions. And if we didn't get to your question, um, as I said, Professor Stefan will try and um, include it in some FAQ guides shortly. Um, so thank you very much, Will, for taking the time tonight. And thanks, Amanda. And thanks to all of you for the terrific we've, uh, support we've had since we launched the Climate Council. Yeah. Thanks very much.